Hi, this is Jason Nickleby, Assistant Director with the Minnesota State High School League, and this is Basketball Officiating Training Tape number one for the 2024-2025 season. Uh, we took a look at the championship games from the spring of 2024, and uh, we pulled selected plays from those games to put into these tapes for this year, and again, hoping that they will be part of pre-games for officials and that coaches will take a look at these plays to have a better understanding of rules, application, mechanics, philosophy, and how we're pulling all of those things together uh, to have as smooth of games as possible for this season. Um, again, when we're looking at these plays, we're not picking on any one official or crew or player or team, just trying to learn from these plays and use them again as we prepare for our games each week and throughout the season. Uh, we should have roughly eight of these, probably six of them for sure for credit on Arbiter. Again, officials who would like to be considered for a state tournament assignment need to complete these on the Arbiter eligibility tab, and they need to do so by January 20th. So make sure that uh, we do that. We'll include the dates and other requirements in the memos um, and be sure to take a look at those and incorporate that information into your pregame. So appreciate all of your efforts to get ready for this season and we're looking forward to a great season again this year. Uh, the crews in the championship games last year did an awesome job and it will be uh, fun to look at their plays and and uh, discuss those and again use several of the things that we identify in these clips to get better as we progress throughout this season. So with that let's take a look at some plays. On this first play I want to talk about the faking being fouled or flopping provisions that were modified for the NFHS rules for this year. That includes rules 449, 644G, 1021H, and 1046F are the applicable rules as it relates to faking being fouled. In the past, faking being fouled or flopping was a very significant penalty and officials were very reluctant to to make that call and in many cases officials didn't even know that was a provision in the rules book. Um, now that it's been changed to a warning for the first team offense and a team technical for any subsequent offense by that team, it's the hope that officials will make this call when these types of actions occur in a game. Now let me start by saying faking being fouled or flopping does not happen quite as often as I think people believe. Um, it's not going to happen every other time down the court and in many cases um, some officials will go an entire season without even seeing one and then other officials may have uh, half a dozen or you know somewhere along those lines but I just want us to know that first of all this doesn't happen all that often but if we have actions that are obvious clear intent to deceive the officials or to get them to call a foul that isn't there. That's what we're talking about when it comes to faking being fouled or flopping. Um, anything that we're not sure on or is is kind of 50-50, we want officials to leave that alone and just officiate it like we would have done in the past. But when you have obvious flopping, obvious um, attempts by the player to get the officials to make a foul call, those are what we're looking for when it comes to flopping um, violations, so to speak. So in this case, we have the dribbler that comes down in transition, comes down that lane line and encounters a defender who has legal guarding position. But as this dribbler turns into the defender, she makes very minimal contact with her head area uh, to the upper chest of the defender who falls over uh, really for no reason. This kind of contact uh, shouldn't cause this kind of displacement. This is a flop 
and this is one that should be called. Um, so let's talk process. This is a flop by the defense, so we're going to let it play out. We're going to make the flopping signal, okay? So we're going to make that signal, and then we are going to let the offense take their uh, their shot here. So you see that it's kicked out, and they take an immediate three. We're going to wait until control is gained on the rebound, and then we will stop the game and make the call. Now, if the offense gets the rebound here and goes back up for a layup, I would let them do that. And then once the basket is successful or the defense gets the rebound um, or the offense stops making progress towards the basket, we can go ahead and kill the play and assess the flopping uh, violation. Now, it's not truly a violation. It's more of an administrative stoppage. So we're stopping the game to assess a warning in the first team offense. In this case, this is the first offense by this team uh, in the game. We're going to have to notify the coach. We're going to tell the book. The book is going to note a team warning for flopping or faking being fouled. They don't need a team number or anything like that. It's just a team warning for the first offense. And because it's an administrative stoppage and not a true violation, we're not going to do anything with the shot clock. Whatever the point of interruption was at the time we stopped the game, we're going to continue the game uh, with those same parameters. Um, we're going to talk about it on the very next play, what to do if it is a team technical foul. In this case, it's the first offense, so it would be a team warning. And because the defense is the guilty party, we're going to let the offense continue on. We don't want to take away an advantage by the team that did not flop um, in this case. If the defense or the offense flops, uh, and we have some examples of that, then if it happens before a shot attempt, we're going to kill it immediately and assess the flop warning or team technical, depending on uh, the number of occurrences. And then if we have a shot attempt with the offense and a flop, such as a shooter throwing themselves to the ground for no reason, then we're going to allow the shot to continue, wait for a rebound or successful field goal, and we will kill the game at that point and assess uh, the flop. Um, we can stop the game during a shot attempt, but in that case, we have no team control. Uh, in the, whether the defense or offense does it, we don't have team control, which means we have to go to the arrow to establish who's going to get the ball on point of interruption um, when it is a warning. On the team technical, we're going to have two free throws in the ball at midcourt, but uh, in this case, very first offense of the game, it is a team warning. So it doesn't matter who does it from now on. It would be a team technical after this. We would continue with point of interruption. In this case, the uh, field goal was not successful. The defense got the rebound. They would continue with the throw-in on the end line with a 35-second shot clock. On this play, take a look at the offensive player in the lane line closest to the bench and watch as she comes across the paint. She clips feet with the defender and throws her, her head back and screams all because we clip, clipped our toes together. Uh, this is action or physical uh, behavior that shouldn't occur because we clipped toes. Um, if she got pushed uh, or there was more body contact, I would understand um, that reaction, but we shouldn't have this kind of reaction when we clip toes. This is a flop. We're trying to draw a foul call here. Um, this, this kind of contact with the feet uh, shouldn't uh, elicit this kind of response. Um, so this is the second flop or faking being fouled um, by violation by the same team in this game. Um, it happens to be the same player as the previous play, but that by rule that doesn't matter. Um, it's only a team warning and then a team technical. Um, so the first one was a warning for the team. 
second occurrence, which is what happens here, uh, would be a team technical. The, when it is a team technical, it is not charged to the player individually. It does not go towards the coach losing their uh, uh, standing privileges. Uh, doesn't go towards ejection of a coach or or the player. Doesn't go towards one of their five fouls towards uh, disqualification. It is just one foul added to their seven or ten team fouls for the half. Um, that's it. And in this case, because it is the second one, and we're going to have a team technical, we will shoot two free throws at the other end. Uh, we will have a throw-in at the division line for the opponent and a 35-second shot clock. Um, because this is, uh, you know, 80 feet from the basket, we're going to just stop the game right here and give the flop or faking being fouled signal, um, communicate with the coach, tell the table this is our second uh, flop of the game against this team, so we will have a team technical. Please only add one foul to the foul count for the half, and then we will proceed with two free throws and a throw-in at the division line. Um, so uh, that's what you should do with a second flop violation, and again, it doesn't have to be the same player. It happens to be in this case, but uh, just it's a team warning and then a team technical uh, when we have this second occurrence in the game. Okay, in this one we have a rebound and we're going to head down in transition. We do a nice job of hustling down, getting into position, and we're going to have a player control foul called by the C. So um, remember that in transition, if we have an odd player break, so we have a four on three, three on two, two on one, then the defenders are going to be secondary defenders uh, by by rule. However, in this case, it is not an odd person break, so we're going to officiate this like the restricted area is not even there. Um, and in that case, because it's not involving a secondary defender, we're going to also draw a line right down the middle of the paint as far as whose primary responsibility uh, it is for ruling on this play and because we draw the line down the middle of the paint and it occurs on the center side of that line this is the center's primary responsibility to rule on um, ideally we would like to get to this free throw line extended and get stationary at the time of contact um, but ultimately this is the center's primary responsibility the lead shows good patience allowing the center uh, to take this play all the way to the basket and uh, the defender establishes legal guarding position prior to contact by the offensive player contact is initiated by the offensive player in the torso of the defender and number 30 is properly called for a player control foul by the center so uh, nice mechanics uh, remember when we have a player control foul we can use a fist or we can put a hand behind our head to indicate that we have a player control foul and again in both cases we would put a fist in the air followed by that mechanic and then pointing the direction that we'll be going which is what the center does here so very nice coverage very nice mechanics and a good job of being patient allowing the correct official to take this play On this play, we're going to have a pass that goes into the backcourt and is touched by the offensive player there, and the offense is properly called for a backcourt violation. So if you look at Rule 991, a player shall not be the first to touch the ball after it has been in team control in the front court, which it was, if a player or a teammate last touched or was touched by the ball in the front court before it went into the backcourt. Now, the, the exception is if the defender deflects this, the either team can 
recover the ball. But in this case, the defense does not touch it. Therefore, they are properly called for a backcourt violation. Um, in addition, because this is a violation that takes place in the backcourt, we will have the throw in at one of the four tick marks. And so we're going to have the throw in at the nearest tick mark to where the violation occurred. And it's under that, uh, that line from the elbow of the paint down to the three point line where it intersects the end line. Because it's underneath that, we are going to have it on the tick mark nearest the lane line on the table side, which is where the officials are putting it. So very well done there. And then also because a violation occurred in the backcourt resulting in a front court throw in for the new offense, the shot clock will be set at 20 seconds, which the crew does uh, correctly as well. So very well handled on rules knowledge and then uh, proper throw in spot and shot clock administration. Very well done by the crew. On this one, we're going to have a dribble drive right down the lane line of the paint, and the dribbler shooter is going to encounter a secondary defender who tries to slide over and establish legal guardian position, is not able to do so, and is properly called for a blocking foul by the lead, who is in excellent position to rule uh, and calls this correctly as a block, scores the basket, and then closes on the dead ball action uh, to officiate players after this play has concluded. So uh, just really well done by the lead. We're in really good position. Uh, this is correctly called as a block, and we score the basket. And then the dead ball officiating is, is excellent as well. Uh, just something to note, if this secondary defender uh, that commits the blocking foul were to be on or over the restricted area, this would still only be a regular blocking foul, not a restricted area blocking foul, because in order for it to be a restricted area blocking foul, we have to establish legal guarding position on or over the uh, restricted area. In this case, um, she's outside the restricted area, however, does not establish legal guarding position, so this is just a regular blocking foul. Um, so we would use regular blocking foul mechanics, not restricted area mechanics. We do that here. So just wanted to note uh, the difference between the two. And we, again, excellent position and a very good ruling on this play. On this play, we'll have a offensive player cut to the basket and encounter a secondary defender in the paint. Uh, remember that when we have contact with a secondary defender, the primary official for ruling on the legality of that contact is the lead. In this case, we have a whistle from both center and lead, and both of them have the same thing, which is good, but when we have double whistles, we have a higher chance of having a blarge. Um, so the good thing is we blow and hold and we don't make uh, very quick preliminaries, which is good. We make eye contact and then we move forward with the blocking foul, uh, which I believe is correct. But remember, again, when we have contact with a secondary defender, the primary official for ruling on the legality of that contact is the lead. Um, and the lead, uh, We'll close down to the lane line here and rule on this. And center, if you have a whistle, should blow and hold, and then the lead should take this uh, to the table. Now, the other piece of this is make sure we use signals that match what occurred uh, on, on the court. So in this case, we have a, a defender that tries to wall up uh, and walks into the offensive player and is correctly called for a foul, but we should use the signal in the mechanics manual where we show that they are walking into the offensive player, bodying them out. Uh, that's signal number 57 in the uh, mechanics manual. So use that signal to indicate 
uh, what the defensive player did here. Um, this is not a restricted area blocking foul because we are moving into the shooter. If we would have stopped and then contact was made with a grounded def defender, then we would have had a restricted area blocking foul. In this case, I believe that using signal 57 would accurately describe what occurred. It is a foul properly called, and we would defer to the lead since it is contact with a secondary defender. On this play, we're going to have an entry pass that is deflected that the defense will recover. And we're going to have a offensive player that tries to get to the basketball. And it appears that the defensive player uh, has uh, advantageous uh, position and is called for a foul by the center. I like that the center stays put. We don't bail out on this turnover. We stay there and officiate the primary action and then we put the throw in in the proper spot at the tick on the end line. So that's all well handled. Um, because this player goes to the floor, I think a foul is a proper call, but if we don't go to the floor um, and the defense gets the ball here, the contact's relatively uh, minor, so we could probably pass as an incidental foul, but in this case, as I mentioned, the uh, opponent does go to the floor, so I think this displacement is enough for a foul and is properly called by the center uh, who has really good position to rule on this and, again, puts the throwing in the correct spot and just nice and calm, uh, under control, very nice mechanics and well handled by the center on this play. Okay, this is a really interesting sequence. Um, let's talk mechanics first. So we have the ball get dumped in the paint here, and we're going to have the lead initiate a rotation, which is correct mechanics. That's what we want to do, and we want to pick up this matchup. Now, center, you are working nice and low, which is great, um, but let's stay put and officiate this matchup. We're working our way back out to trail. When we're officiating a, a competitive matchup like this, we don't want to move out to trail until that matchup, um, that action has uh, completed its, its course. So in this case, it's still going. So just stay put and help officiate that, that matchup, especially uh, waiting until the lead uh, gets over there. And then just from a... Uh, judgment standpoint again going back to a previous play I think signal 57 really describes what happens here the defender bodies him out his hands are straight in the air so we will if we call this a foul which I think we should uh, we wouldn't use a blocking signal we'd use signal 57 from the mechanics manual indicating that this defensive player walked this offensive player out um, and we would give two shots. Uh, so if we call the foul here, that's the mechanic that we should use. And again, center, don't bail out to trail uh, just to get to that position. Stay there and officiate that competitive matchup um, and lead. Good job of initiating a rotation to get over to officiate this matchup. Um, and then another interesting aspect of this play, when we go down to the other end of the court, um, we're going to have the offense called out of bounds by the trail, uh, which is fine. But if you if you look at it uh, slowly, you'll see that the player that gets the ball uh, passed uh, to them goes out of bounds on his own and then reestablishes and touches the pass, which is a violation, but it's not an out of bounds violation. Um, it's a violation for going out of bounds on their own volition and being first to touch. Uh, so because of the timing of it, I'm totally fine with just calling this player out of bounds and moving on with the throw in. It's the same effect. But if this had more of a time delay, time element to it, where the player steps out of bounds and then they don't get the pass for two, three, four seconds, um, then we should use the delayed dead ball signal. And then as soon as this player touches 
uh, the pass, we would use the signal to indicate that they came in from out of bounds to touch um, and committed a violation. So really interesting. We don't see that uh, very often, um, but I wanted to point out that uh, the correct mechanic for handling this when they step out of bounds on their own volition first to touch is the delayed dead ball signal followed by uh, stopping the clock for a violation and indicating that they are uh, a player that went out of bounds on their own volition and then were first to touch. So um, mechanics and how we handle front court one-on-one uh, -on -one matchups and then looking at the rule relative to going out of bounds on our own. Okay, we don't talk free throw mechanics very often because we figure, well, these are pretty easy and they, you know, don't have anything happen on them and we just kind of go through them ho-hum and uh, in this case, uh, that's not what happens. We have a foul uh, that's picked up properly by the lead. Um, we do a nice job of not falling asleep here and expecting this to go off like it normally does and we properly call this offensive uh player being pushed in the back uh, by the defensive player in the lower block. So uh, well handled as far as um, getting the foul. Uh, this is uh, correctly, correctly ruled and uh, just do a nice job uh, in that. And remember 35 second shot clock on free throws because we're assuming the defense is going to get the rebound or the shot's going to be made most of the time. So that's why we do that. And if the offense ha happens to get a rebound or we have a foul that doesn't result in free throws, we will go to 20 seconds. Um, also, free throw positioning, remember leads, we need to be four feet outside the lane line and four feet deep of the end line at a minimum. Um, we're a little close here, we pick up the foul, which is great, but let's work as deep as we can. And then remember trails, on the first of multiple free throws, we're gonna be at mid court. Uh, we don't go by the team bench, we're at midcourt, and then on the second or third of multiples, we need to be at the 28-foot mark, and we're not here. Um, we're not even in the screen, so just a reminder, trails on where we belong, and everyone is going to close down on free throws uh, when the attempt is made. So uh, good job of getting this foul. Just a reminder on our free throw positioning, take a look at that in the Mechanics Illustrated and uh, make sure that we're on top of those those positions and how we handle free throws. On this play, we're going to have a three-point attempt in the corner, and I just want us as officials to be aware of the possibility of shooters um, throwing themselves to the floor in flopping type action. Now, in this case, it appears the shooter uh, jumps up and is kind of losing their balance as they're coming down and so I don't have this as a flop violation um, but if you feel that they just throw themselves to the floor in the attempt to try to draw a foul call um, then that would be enough for a flop and remember if it's the first offense by the team in the game whether it's an offensive flop or a defensive flop doesn't matter uh, that's a team warning, and then any subsequent flop or faking being fouled uh, by that same team would result in a team technical. Now, when the offense does it, if you deem this as a flop, um, we would let this, this shot play out, we would wait for a rebound, and then we would kill it. Um, the reason that we wouldn't kill it right away is because there's no team control and we would have to go to the arrow to determine who would get the throw in if it is the team warning. Um, and we, we will have teams that are sophisticated enough to, uh, for example, if they're down by three with only 10 seconds to play uh, and they haven't committed a team technical yet, maybe they'll try to flop uh, and get a call and get the ball back on the arrow. Um, hopefully teams don't do that, but they potentially could, which means we wanna wait till there's a rebound, then we don't have to get the alternating possession arrow involved 
uh, in this play. Um, if we deem the flopping action takes place prior to the shot, then we would kill it immediately and assess the warning or the team technical at that point. Um, continuation applies uh, during this. Again, it's not a violation or a foul. So if we blow the whistle for a flop and the shot is on the way, it would count if it goes in. Um, so just know that. But if we don't have team control or we have a loss of team control as we do on a shot and we kill it prior to any team having established team control again, we have to go to the alternating possession arrow to determine point of interruption. And that just gets a lot more messy. So that's why we're encouraging if you do call a flop, uh, we wait until one of the teams gathers uh, team control and then we can stop the game and move from there. Okay, in this play, we're going to have uh, contact with a uh, defender who I believe establishes legal guardian position and maintains it legally. Remember, they can rise vertically, they can move backwards or move obliquely to maintain this position. And in this case, um, contact is made and the defender loses balance, but I don't believe it's really significant contact by the offensive player. So I think a no call is totally fine in this in this case. Um, I'm sure there's a few few of you that might consider this defensive action falling to the floor as a flop. Um, I think his momentum is carrying him that way, and he loses his balance and goes to the floor. I don't have this as a flop or fake. Uh, faking being fouled. Um, but if you did, uh, again, the offense hasn't and is making progress towards the basket. So we would allow them to continue with that action towards the basket. Uh, we wouldn't call it right away. We wouldn't want to wipe out a uh, an attempt at a basket um, because of something the, the opponent uh, did. But again, in this case, I think his momentum is carrying him that way. He doesn't throw himself to the floor on purpose. I think he just loses his balance. And again, flops aren't going to happen um, quite as often as you think. I'm just showing several of these examples so that you see uh, what we have to consider and that we, we need obvious intent to deceive or obvious intent by the player to get the official to call a foul. And I, I just don't see that here. Um, and I believe we properly no call this. Um, on this play, and we would continue to no call that action again this year. On this last play, take a look at the defender and what he does with his head in the front court. Um, the offensive player kind of reaches out and kind of feels for him a little bit, and he throws his head back uh, to try to draw a foul call by the officials. Now, um, I think this is one, if you see this um, in a game, especially this late in the contest, I think you can talk to this defender and say, hey, do me a favor, you know, just continue to play great defense. You don't need to try to draw a foul or do anything special or exaggerated to try to, to get a call. Um, if you get fouled, I'll call it. Um, and uh, happy to talk to you about, about that, you know, when we have the chance. But... Um, don't throw your head back like that um, because I really don't want to get involved with a flop, you know, at this stage of the game. If it's much more exaggerated than this, um, very obvious to everyone there, then we would have to call it as a flop. Um, and again, if it's the first one, it's a team warning. And if it's the second one, it's a team technical. And in this case, because the offensive player is 40 feet from the basket at the time of this potential flop violation, uh, we would just stop the game right then and adjudicate the flop. So again, I don't think this is enough. I think this is one we need to just talk to this player uh, about. But if it's much more exaggerated than this and obviously an intent to try to get the officials to call a foul um, by throwing their head back, uh, then we would call a flop in that case, uh, a warning on the first offense for the team and team technical on any subsequent violation. Okay, that will do it for training tape number one. 
Um, a few examples of flopping or faking being fouled, and then a couple of examples uh, where we would not have flopping um, and some kind of in between. So just uh, some plays to take a look at. And again, when we're talking about flopping or faking being fouled, it's not going to happen all that often. But when it does, it's going to be really obvious. It's going to jump out at you, and it will be obvious that a player is trying to get the officials to call a foul. In that case, we would want a flopping um, violation to be called in that case. So um, take a look at these plays and some others and um, just really get that um, into your head uh, that we're looking for obvious um, intent to deceive. And then also um, remember the team control aspect that if we don't have team control, we have to go to the arrow to determine point of interruption for a throw in. And that's just a lot more messy um, than to allow a play to potentially play out, um, you know, during shot attempts uh, in particular. So um, get our nose in the rules book. Uh, make sure we're reviewing the mechanics uh, illustrated. All of the eligibility requirements are due. Uh, November 20th at midnight um, and then after that the training tapes uh, will be uh, due for completion before the middle of January to be considered for a state tournament assignment so um, thanks for your dedication and your uh, preparation so far um, get out and work some scrimmages and uh, we're looking forward to games starting here soon